help each other. I wouldn't say they are necessarily, absolutely necessary to grow whatever you want to grow, okay? Because they, they're more an aid rather than a necessity. So companion crops can lend a hand, for, for instance, giving other crops shade. So your corn is going to shade your beans. Your beans are going to grow better if you put bush, bush beans next to corn. Your corn is going to also form a frame for your pole beans to grow up. So, you know, there, there, are, there are ways of doing things. Um, if you're using, they use each other's nutrients that they leave in the soil efficiently. So if you're into cropping, which is what, it's an agricultural term. Um, but if you're going to grow uh, beans or peas, any of the legumes in one spot, what they do is they take in nitrogen through their leaves, it goes down the stem and it goes down into the roots and it gets into some nodules on the roots. Bacteria come in through the soil and they then take that nitrogen and they use it and they fix it into the soil so you're actually growing using more nitrogen because after all your, your main three nutrients are nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. So your nitrogen-fixing bacteria need to have your legumes to be able to do that. They work symbiotically, they work together. Um, you can use companion plants to prevent pest problems as catch crops or repellent or trap crops, as they're called. So you grow, say, if you really think you can spare it, you grow an eggplant near your potatoes. The Colorado potato beetle would rather go to the eggplant than the potatoes. So you're going to have safe potatoes, but you're going to have, have a destroyed eggplant. Um, the same with nasturtiums. The same with, uh, what else would we use for trap cropping? Uh, buckwheat for one, sometimes. Yeah. Repellent crops. Uh, if you plant chives near roses, aphids don't like anything that smells of onion. So you're not going to get aphids on your roses. Clever. Ah. So, but they are not, you know, they're not the be all and end all. You've got to do it holistically. And this is what I'm trying to say. And some of your, uh, uh, some of these companion plants will attract the beneficial insects. So if you're using tansy or yarrow or even goldenrod, <gasps> I love goldenrod in the right place. The trouble with goldenrod, have one plant next year, because it mats out underground and it sets up suckers, you're going to have 15. The next year you'll have 50. That's the problem with goldenrod, but it is brilliant. If you can have it in a hedgerow sort of somewhere, just near your vegetable patch, it's great. But uh, don't plant it in your vegetable patch because you'll never get rid of it. So that will attract beneficial insects that will eat the bad bugs. But any of this is not enough. You've got to keep working at your soil. You've got to work beneficially with your soil and then not use pesticides. Because then you're going to, if you start using pesticides, except very, very natural ones, you're, if you're going to use chemical ones, you're going to wipe out your whole biodiversity and your whole ecosystem. It all works in an ecosystem. So it's, that's, that's what we're trying to look at. So um, plant-friendly companions. So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get from spring right through to fall plants that will attract insects that are good by pollen, by nectar, by smell, by color. And all those things are, are attractants to, to insects. So, the easy ones to grow in spring are chives, obviously, because they've A, got a, a repellent smell for one side, and then the other side is that they, they do produce a lot of nectar in their little purple heads. And those purple heads make wonderful addition to um, vinegar, mm -hmm. if you want a flavoured vinegar for your salads later in the year. Top picture there is Aubretia, which is known as rock cress. Um, and that is one of the earliest flowering spring plants, and it's brilliant for bees. So if you want bumblebees, that's the one to bring in. And then 
Uh, I grow that, but I have that picture is actually uh, from somebody's catalogue because I don't grow all four colours. There are four colours. The pinks grow extremely well, the white grows well. The blue doesn't grow quite as easily. And then the old dog rose or the rugosa roses, the hardy, the really hardy roses are brilliant as well. So um, heather and ling, which are both acid loving, so if you've got acid soil, they grow well. Um, they are very early flowering together with Daphne, which is a little shrub about that big, which is purple flowers, so sort of spike of purple flowers. They're about to bloom, too. Yeah, mine, mine is just, a, yeah. just starting. Yeah. Uh, English daisies, the little, uh, what they call Bellis perennis, which is the little one that you would find in your lawn, but they've now grown it a bit better, so it's either pink or white or fairly dark red, and it's got sort of double and treble and quite nice. Pinks, which are um, a form of small carnation, they, they do well as well. So those are the ones that are spring flowering, and they help you with beneficials. And they're all, apart from the rock crest, which does spread quite badly, and the roses, which I wouldn't plant directly in your vegetable patch, but I've, as I say, I've got a big hedge of them, because it, it blocks out the north wind. Um, those, those won't give you too much trouble. Uh, summer. This is my, my garden in summer. Um, lavender is a very good repellent because it's so strongly scented, but it also uh, hoverflies. Love lavender. Black eyed Susans, very easy to grow, and they'll self seed for you so easily it's just not funny. Well, that's why I've got this huge patch of them <laughs> in, this, in this picture. Um, then Coreopsis, which is the little, if we go back to the beginning, that was that yellow flower at the beginning. Sorry. That's the yellow flower in that picture. That mallow is, is also, it's, a, it's actually a, a native species, and that's, that's very good for, flower, for um, beneficials as well. So let's just whip through these back to where I was. Cranesbill is a form, is, they've, they've split the genus geranium. Um, and Cranesbill is the original form of geranium. It's got the, the scented leaves like a perlegonium, but it's got a long tail at the back of the flower, and it comes in pink and blue, and that will spread like anything. But it's very good for the tachinid flies. Most of the flies will go to that. Uh, Helianthus is a, is a very small, like a sunflower, it's bright, bright yellow, like the Coreopsis as well. Nasturtiums, I'm sure everybody knows. Everybody knows nasturtiums? Yeah. And Shasta daisy, which is the ordinary white field daisy that we grow here. Um, pretty well grows wild. Tansy and yarrow. Tansy, uh, you're a little bit aware of. Um, it sometimes stops some of the vegetables growing. So just a little bit careful of that one. Yarrow is fine. Um, that's Achillea, and it comes in white, yellow. The, the white one is wild and it grows about that big, and it's got a, um, like a Queen Anne's lace head. Yeah, Queen Anne's lace, brilliant for beneficials as well, but don't bring it into the garden, try and keep it at a distance, because, again. How important do these flowers have to be in the vegetable garden? I, beneficial, because I have them in my backyard, and some of them are um, um, well, right yeah, this lot um, is about 200 yards from my vegetable patch, these ones. This, this garden is about up to 200 yards away. Yeah. Um, if you can interplant them with your vegetables, some of them, the ones that aren't going to grow into enormous great chunks, the annual ones, it's, it's good to have them literally in with your vegetables. Yeah. Okay. And in the companions in the fall, now this is a little bit more difficult because uh, by then, you know, your bees are dropping off, your plants are dropping off. And the top one there is Joe Pieweed. That's one of the Joe Pie weeds. Um, that's the more common one. That's really fragrant, isn't it? Oh, no. the, the, oh, I know the one you mean. The chocolate one actually is the fragrant one. Yeah, this is just the common old garden one. You know, it's the ordinary one. Um, Boltonia is the aster that has tiny little blue flowers that it grows about that high, I suppose. And it's um, actually, they're, they're sort of almost like star-like flowers. Blue, purple, it's a sort of purple blue with a, um, a deep pink center. And it's, it's basically, it was a weed. 
and I've got masses of them growing with sort of terrible sort of self seeding. Cone flowers, um, all the cone flowers. Now, uh, May the 27th, uh, from 12 to 4 at the market, the Fredericton Garden, uh, Botanic Gardens Association is going to have a plant sale, it's annual plant sale. And one of the things is they're going to have, I believe they're going to have some of the different colored cone flowers this year. So if anybody's interested in cone flowers. Echinacea. Echinacea, for those of you who are interested in herbal remedies, echinacea is the one that you take to ward off colds. You should take it from the beginning of fall right through the winter and you won't have a cold. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, so that picture we've got bee balm at the front, the red as you see here is the red bee balm. You can get it in pink as well. Monada, Monada didima. Um, that's another group of um, Black Eyed Susan, but a slightly different one. And at the back, uh, we've got the cone flowers. And if you look further up the hillside there, that's one of my vegetable patches. Other side, this is actually a cherry tree, but other side of the cherry tree is my vegetable patches. Does your bee balm smell like pepper? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. And you, uh, Oswego tea. Has anybody ever drunk Oswego tea? Very American thing, actually. Um, it comes from the bee balm leaves, and it's, it's supposed to be very, very healthy tea. It's, it's quite a sharp tea. And Our brains came from bee balm. Bergamot. 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 Yes. Bergamot. Yeah. Same Bergamot. Same thing. Bee balm? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of these things are sort of inter, interrelated. And then my one of my favourites, borage at the top. This is one of the herbs. Now, again, this is a silver bullet. A, you can eat the flowers. Edible flowers, yes! B, you can use the leaves um, for making tea. And they taste like cucumber, slightly like cucumber. So, spritzer. Put a couple of the blue flowers in, put a couple of leaves in, and you are made in a really hot summer's evening. Borage is your man. Are those all perennials? Uh, no, these are, these are uh, annuals. Yeah, borage is an annual. And you can buy that seed virtually anywhere. That's it. But it's, once you've got it, you'll never get rid of it. It's lovely, because it, it just comes up every year of its own accord. Um, so these all attract beneficial insects. Dill, everybody knows dill. Dill for dill pickling? Yes. Fennel. Now, watch out for fennel. Fennel is wonderful, and you get that gorgeous purple, uh, 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 copper colour fennel. Don't plant it in your vegetable patch. It stops other plants from growing. So, fennel, keep on one side. Fennel and dill will grow together, but fennel and anything else, it's allelopathic, which means that it will stop actual growth of certain plants. It's like maple leaves. Don't put raw maple leaves on your plants, uh, on, your, on your beds, because they actually have and, uh, maple and black walnut leaves. They have certain chemicals in them that will stop plants from growing. So rot them very, very well for a whole year before you put them anywhere near your, your plants, your vegetables. So this is dill growing with um, green peppers. And the smell of the dill will keep the bugs off the green peppers. Mint, obviously, is wonderful. Mint, I have three types of mint, and it is just a buzz with bees from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, and it lasts a long time, too. And, of course, basil. If you put basil next to tomatoes, tomato hornworm, things like that, won't grow. won't go there, because basil's... Uh, and the other thing is lemon balm. 